Should Christians keep the Sabbath? That is a great question. Let's take an unbiased view of what the scriptures have to say about it. Welcome back to the Down to Earth Christian. If you have questions or video topic suggestions that you would like to submit for future videos here on the channel, well, there is a link down in the description below, or you can scan the QR code here on your screen and you can submit those requests. We really want to hear from you and we look forward to making videos that you request. Before we jump into answering the question of whether or not Christians should keep the Sabbath today, let's first answer the question, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Let's see what God has to say. And the Lord said to Moses, you shall speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Anyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Whoa, now if that's not clear enough, over in Numbers chapter 15, verses 32 through 36, we see that there was a man who was caught collecting sticks on the Sabbath, and he was put to death for working on the Sabbath. God also said this, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. So is it a sin if we don't keep the Sabbath? Well, we just read that everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. And whoever does any work on it, his soul shall be cut off from among his people. Then according to these verses, it surely sounds like not keeping the Sabbath is a sin. But, but do you have to keep the Sabbath to be saved? Well, I mean, if you don't want your soul to be cut off from among God's people, you better keep the Sabbath, wouldn't you say? In light of that, I mean, would it be just total foolishness to even ask the question, should Christians keep the Sabbath? I mean, doesn't it seem obvious? Well, before we actually answer that question, if you are enjoying this video, would you please go ahead and give it a thumbs up? It really helps out the channel. So who was the Sabbath given to? I mean, did God give it to everyone or to just a few select people? Right? Some think that, that God instituted the Sabbath in the Garden of Eden because of the connection that we see with the Sabbath and creation in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Now, it is true that God rested on the seventh day, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, but there is no biblical record of the Sabbath before the children of Israel leave Egypt under Moses' leadership. Right? A simple search of the Hebrew word for Sabbath shows that. In fact, nowhere in Scripture is there even a hint that Sabbath keeping was practiced from Adam to Moses, which was the patriarchal age, by the way. We did a three-part video series walking you through all three ages of biblical history. That's the patriarchal age, the Mosaic age, and the Christian age. I will link to those down in the description below, and I'll also put them at the end of the video on the end screen, so you can go ahead and watch them there when you're done with this video. And so who then did God give the Sabbath to? Right? He didn't give it to Adam. He didn't give it to Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Joseph. So who did he give it to? Well, God gave the Sabbath to the children of Israel when he brought them out by the hand from the land of Egypt. Right? We see that first in Exodus chapter 16, verses 23 through 30. Then we see it again listed in the Ten Commandments. Listen to whom God gave this covenant too. And God summoned all of Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. 
Now, later in chapter 5, Moses restates the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath observances in verses 12 through 14. Then Moses gives the reason for the Sabbath and why God gave it to the nation of Israel. Listen to what he says. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord our God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord our God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. God's intent for giving the Sabbath to Israel was not so that they would remember creation, but so that they would remember that they were slaves in Egypt, and it was God who gave them deliverance from there. And the Lord spoke to Moses, you shall speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Moses said that the Lord made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who were all of us here alive today. And when God was explaining the Sabbath to the Israelites, he said, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for they are a sign between me and you throughout your generations. This covenant, this, this Sabbath was special for the Israelites who came out of Egypt. He didn't, he didn't give this covenant and he didn't give this Sabbath to the Egyptians but he gave it to those who escaped from Egypt. Unfortunately, the Jews did not keep this covenant. They didn't keep God's law, and God punished them by allowing them to be conquered by their enemies and be taken into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. Now, because of their disobedience, God said that he would make a new covenant with them. Behold, the day is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. You know, around 750 years later, Jesus the Christ is born. He was born an Israelite, living his entire life under the covenant that God made with the Israelites when he brought them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I can say with 100% certainty that Jesus kept the Sabbath. Why can I say that? Why can I be so confident that Jesus kept the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath was God's law. And to not keep the Sabbath is sin. And since Jesus never sinned, he must have kept the Sabbath perfectly. However, what did Jesus say about that law that he kept perfectly? Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. And so the question is, how did Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? Well, one of the ways is by fulfilling all of the prophecies that were given about Jesus, the hundreds of prophecies concerning him coming as the Messiah, the Son of God. Number two, Jesus fulfilled the law by keeping the law perfectly and by becoming the perfect sacrifice for sin. Therefore he, that is Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified." You know, as Jesus was dying on the cross, just after he made arrangements for his mother to be cared for, this is what the Bible says. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Jesus had accomplished all that he came to do. He fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the prophets. Christ's death and his resurrection brought the new covenant into effect. That is why the Hebrew writer quotes from Jeremiah. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is acted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the day is coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. God found fault with them, right? They didn't keep his covenant. He made a new covenant with them. And this new covenant has a purpose. The purpose of the law was to bring the Jews to Christ. The Bible says, The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So with the death of Jesus on the cross, the law of Moses became fulfilled, right? The law of Moses has become obsolete. The Jews who have faith in Christ are no longer under the guardian, that is the law. The Gentiles were never under the law of Moses or under the guardian that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 3. The new covenant that God has made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah also applies to everyone, right? Not only the Jews. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, so I see that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, that he established a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, and that that new covenant applies to the whole world. But I'm a little bit confused because it sounds like we're no longer under the law of Moses. But, but as Christians, I mean, we're not supposed to steal. We're not supposed to murder we're not supposed to bear false witness or commit adultery. We are supposed to honor our father and our mother. So it only makes sense that we ought to keep the Sabbath as well. And you know, that seems to make perfect sense. But let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Because the early church struggled with this very question. They were confused about whether or not they were to keep the law of Moses, whether or not they were to keep the Sabbath, circumcision, dietary food laws, and all of that. In Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 5, ethnically Jewish Christians were trying to, to force Gentile Christians to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses, which would include the Sabbath law. Paul and Barnabas, they were up in Antioch, and the Judaizers, they had come down from Judea and were teaching this to the brothers there. They were saying, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So after Paul and Barnabas had a lot of discussion with these teachers, they ended up heading down to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles and the elders to kind of try to straighten this thing out. After they got there, they were explaining what God was doing through them. And some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Here is the perfect opportunity for God to say that he wants us to keep the Sabbath today, that it is a sin to not keep the Sabbath. But listen to what God had to say about this. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. No greater burden than these requirements, he says. And you know, he didn't even mention 
the Sabbath. You would think that this letter would, would clear things up, but unfortunately, it didn't. You know, sometimes we want what we want. We are, we're caught up in the way that things have always been, and we want them to stay that way. These ethnically Jewish Christians, they wanted to bind the law of Moses on Gentile Christians, and they wanted to judge them for not keeping it, including not keeping the Sabbath. Listen to what God had to say when he was talking to Gentile Christians about this very subject. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festivals or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Don't you find it interesting that the early church was never commanded to keep the Sabbath? In fact, the only time that we ever see people gathering on the Sabbath is when they were Jews gathering on the Sabbath. And the only reason that we even read about that situation is because Paul goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath to evangelize them, trying to free them from the law of sin and death. He does this continually until finally they opposed him and reviled him. He shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That is the last time we see anyone gathering on the Sabbath day in scripture. You know what we do see though? We see Christians gathering every first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. So does God want us to keep the Sabbath? The Sabbath law was a shadow that was fulfilled in Christ. If we want to go ahead and rest on the Sabbath day, right, we can go ahead and do that. There is no commandment in Scripture forbidding resting on Saturday. But there is plain teaching in Scripture that instructs us not to pass judgment on those who choose to work, kindle a fire, or gather sticks on Saturday. We also plainly see in Scripture that Christians gathered for worship on the first day of every week and that we are commanded to not forsake our assembling together. Here are those videos that I told you about you earlier that take you through the three biblical ages, the patriarchal age, the mosaic age, and the Christian age. I will see you over in those videos in just a second.